Hi, Carcanus Village. Thanks for letting us come and uh, give you another little talk about springtime and what we can do in the garden in springtime. Uh, today, uh, we have three master gardeners, one of them including me. I'm Mo Mensch. And then we have Jean Eckenstam and we have Sheila Clyatt. And uh, we've been master gardening collectively for about 30 years now. And our uh, favorite thing to do together is work in the uh, Benicia School District. And we, in specific, uh, work with the Liberty High School, the Benicia High School, and um, Mary Farmer Elementary School. Uh, so uh, that's where our happiness lies. And we've learned lots of stuff out there. And today we're going to share a little bit about um, Mo's top five. So my top five seed selections, my top five start selections and my top five pollinator selections. Then uh, Jean's gonna give us a little snippet on pruning and the nuances of pruning. And she was gonna end it with the wonderful world of bees. So sit back and enjoy. Um, my, my planting technique actually is gonna be, I call it my, my Mo's top five. And I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, my Mo's top fivers. And basically what I'm going to share with you is my top five seeds I like for spring, my top five uh, starts I like to put in for spring, and my top five pollinator plants that I like to put in for spring. And so when I'm sharing my top five seeds, I I've uh, gotten pictures off the internet. So it's the seed packet is not my favorite seed packet. It's just the seed packet that um, showed up on the screen. So um, we could talk more about seeds later, but here's my top five seeds. Beets is kind of my number one because I love beets and I love just the different ways you can eat them. You can eat them raw, you can roast them, uh, you can juice them. Uh, I also really like them because uh, they're super easy to grow and they're abundant and they're colorful and it, they're just fun. They're colorful in the ground. They're colorful when you take them out. They're colorful foliage for your uh, bed. Another is carrots. Again, I'm, I'm totally into color, both underground and on top of ground. And then when you get to put them on your uh, table to eat. Another super easy crop to grow as well by seed. And we have kale here. Kale comes in all different sizes and flavors and textures. Lettuce, again, comes in all different colors, flavors, textures. One of the fun things for me about gardening is just uh, being able to see the color, being able to look out your patio and just how the color adds fun to your garden. Spinach, another fun, easy crop to grow. A lot, all of these two that I've shared um, that I really like about the particular crops is you can eat them both raw or cooked. So you can just pick them right out of your garden or you can bring them home. Uh, or inside and give them a little cooking. And here's my favorite top five starts. Most of these you can find in your uh, favorite garden spot, Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace, uh, Rayleigh's, tomatoes. Tomatoes are ready to roll now. If you have a lot of space, Pumpkins are a great thing to start now for some fall fun. Peppers, again, I love the color and the flavors and the textures of these. You can go from super hot to just sweet and crunchy. Cucumbers. and an abundance of different kinds of squash that you can plant right now. And then my, my next favorite is gonna be my top five pollinators. Super important to create an environment where you can get some 
bees and some hummingbirds and some different kinds of insects to come and hang out with your flowers and pollinate your fruits and veggies. This is one of my favorite, favorite all time ones, Salvia Hot Lips. It's the most forgiving salvia I've ever known. I've, uh, I've had mine in my backyard for years and years and years, and it just keeps flowering and the bees and the hummingbirds just love it. Rosemary, super hardy, super fun. You can, you can do it oh as a ground God. cover That's or you can do it as a shrub. <laughs> You see a lot of Mexican sage around Benicia. Uh, it's, it loves Benicia and uh, it's a, again, another forgiving sage. You can chop it down and it'll grow back every year just as beautiful as ever. And then these just pop up you know, everywhere and they're, they're just beautiful. They're our state flower and the uh, insects and bees just absolutely love them. And my favorite all time is the sunflower. So that's your brief overview of Mo's top five seeds and uh, starts and pollinator plants. And uh, take pruning. it away, Gene. And you may think that it's a little odd time of the year to be pruned, don't you? Uh, the first question usually is, well, don't you do that in January and February? We've sort of missed our chance. And the answer is not necessarily. It is true that most people prune trees and shrubs uh, in January and February for the obvious reason. The deciduous trees have lost their leaves and you can see the sh shape that they really have and you can make major decisions about uh, how you want the tree to look or grow. Uh, if it's not a deciduous tree, it's still dormant. And so it's a time when it's okay to, to prune it. Basically, you don't want to be pruning a, a tree or a shrub when it's ready to put out its flowers or its fruit because you'll it, it needs all the energy it has to do the, to do the fruit and flower production and it doesn't have any despair to heal the wounds that you may have caused by, by, by pruning. Uh, but the, the reason for the dormant season, as I've said, is so you can see, and it is also the time when the, when the plant has been resting. What's interesting is that native plants, California native plants, have a different dormant season than other plants. And that's just because of the way they've evolved in response to the climate. Uh, they, they are, they are, their dormancy is uh, determined by water supply. And so July, August, and September are when there is no water. It's other times of the year too, but we hope we get rain those times. But you can count on no, no rain in June, July, August, and September. And that's when a native plant goes dormant. So that's an important distinction to keep in mind. The, the other plants, the, let's say fruit trees, uh, their dormancy is determined by temperature. And so it's, that's why we do our pruning in January of, of those mm -hmm. kinds of trees. Uh, the other thing is that it's not uh, anything magic about pruning only once a year. Uh, there are a number of uh, fruit growers, uh, backyard orchard people, who would uh, prune maybe uh, three times a year. Uh, once in the dormant time in, in January, again in summer, and then again in fall. And each, each of those prunings has a different, different kind of purpose. Uh, the thing about pruning is that it's a thoughtful exercise. If you try to do everything the same way and everything automatically, it's not best for the plant. It's important to think about how the plant grows, how it fruits or produces flowers, how it looks and how you want it to look. And it's true that you can force it to do what it, it doesn't want to do in favor of what you want to do. 
And the example of that is an espalier. You know, you may have seen a, a tree pruned up against a wall that produces apples, but it's basically a, a flat tree. It is not rounded in any way. And that's just because of the pruning track practices that have, uh, have been used to make that possible. Pruning and, and binding or shaping it uh, by tying, tying branches in certain ways. But when you're, when you're thinking about your pruning, uh, you might think of what can be called the three squared approach. Three, three approaches, three times, makes nine. Uh, so there, the three Ds are to look for dead, diseased, and damaged uh, limbs. The three Cs are crossing, crowding, and competing limbs. And the three Ss are safety, sight lines, and shape. Now, those last two are aesthetic questions. How do you, how, what makes the tree look best in your landscape? But the most important is perhaps the first one, to get rid of dead, disease, damaged uh, limbs. And that's best done uh, thoughtfully. Now I have here uh, my, my prop of the day. And this is, this is actually a branch from our California, from uh, Cienosa Thirstiflorus, which is California lilac uh, as the common name for it. But it was a branch I could, I could uh, spare for the day uh, uh, discussion. When you're pruning, make sure that you do sharp and clean cuts. Uh, that means your, your pruner needs to be sharp and all the residue sap from previous prunings needs to be cut, cleaned off. Because when, a, when the cut is clean, as, as you might be able to see here, there is no room for an insect or for water damage or whatever to, to gather on it. It's clean. It's also best if it's a, like about a 45 degree angle because then again, moisture doesn't collect on there and there's no, no opportunity for something to, to infect it. So that's one, one trick, one trick. The other is when you're pruning, and you want to control the direction. Now, now, most often we do this with roses. Uh, you heard it's, you've heard it said to prune to an outside bud. So if you look on, this, on the stem that you're concerned about, you can see spots. Uh, sometimes it, there's an actual uh, line that makes it look like a joint. Other times it's just a, a small swelling of the bark. But that's where there's a growth bud. And you want to cut just above that with it pointing in the direction that you want the tree to grow or the rose to grow. Uh, and basically what you're trying to do with most pruning is open up the inside. It's, it's important to get sunlight down into the plant. Um, and that will give you your best structure, your best leaves and your best fruit if it's, if it's a fruit tree. But when you, when, you, when you prune, make sure it's a, a straight flush cut. I mean, sorry, it's a straight cut. It's not, it's not jagged in any way. And that's why you use those uh, clean and sharp tools. But here's a thing that has not usually been uh, thought about or followed. I hope you can see this. I know you can't see what I can see. There is where the, where the branch joins the tree. There is a thing called a growth ridge or a growth collar. And it's right about here. And most of us have made the mistake of cutting that straight down, cutting, cutting it close to the, to the main branch, main limb. That's a mistake because if you damage that collar, the, the wound will not heal quite as well. And it again opens up the opportunity for, for invasion or by pests or uh, damage from disease. So what you want to do, if you can find that 
color and you can see it best on a more a bigger tree a mature tree so walk around your neighborhood and see if you can spot a limb that has that growth ridge but it's right at that spot so what you would want to do in this case if this were a bigger tree you would cut it at about this angle at that spot and when you cut it off this limb will, this cut will show round like like the end of this pointer if it's oval you've done it the wrong way because if it's oval it's cut into that that little collar now the other thing about pruning are are removing a branch imagine this was a two or a three inch branch it's too big too heavy to use a lopper on or a, or a hand pruner you've got to use a saw some of us make the mistake of just going right here right here and sawing how we're going to saw well what happens because this is such a heavy limb this will tear the bark when it gets to about seven eighths of the way through it won't cut all the way it will just fall of its own weight and tear the bark down this way that's what you want to avoid because again it's a wound that is uh, difficult for the for the tree to heal so the technique for avoiding that is to move up the branch several inches and make a bottom excuse me i have to remember which way i'm looking you have to make a bottom cut with the saw up to almost halfway. When the tree, when the weight of the limb starts to bend it down and bind your saw, that's time to move and go to a different spot. So having made this cut, you go up another two or three inches and then you start cutting from the top down. And when you do that, the weight of that branch will snap it off somewhere between the two cuts. Then you make a third cut, which is your final cut, taking the branch off where it's supposed to come off here. Um, it's really easy to not do that step and, and you end up with a wound in the tree that has a hard time healing. Uh, the other thing about clean cuts, I saw a, a, a garden or a yard yesterday where someone had shaped everything like they wanted in shape and, and everything in the, in the yard was either a cube, a rectangle, or a ball. You know, they, they like the geometric shapes. Not all plants like to grow that way or look best that way. But if, that's the, if that is a hedge that you're pruning or something that you're pruning to a shape like that, even if you use hedge, climber, hedge trimmers, be sure you go back with uh, your pruners and, and make those uh, clean cuts because what I saw yesterday was a lot of stubs, a lot of damaged bark, a lot of pieces that were going to be difficult for, for the plant to heal itself. Uh, it will over time, but it won't look very pretty in, in the meantime. And to finish off, just a couple of comments about uh, fruit trees particularly. As I said, this is a thoughtful exercise. And think about where does the fruit work or land or grow on the tree? Some fruits grow from, or flowers grow from fruit wood along the branch. Some go from spurs like apples. And though you don't want to cut those off either because then you won't have any, any more apples. But you want to encourage, if you have fruit wood, you want to encourage that to be open to the sunlight. And interestingly, a horizontal branch like this will produce more fruit than a vertical branch like this. And the reason for that is that it, the sun is more direct and more consistent on this lateral branch. So some people, when they buy a new, new tree and plant, a, plant it, they will force a, a limb like this to be more like that. And they do that either by tying weights on the end or putting some kind of a wood brace here that keeps forcing it out. Now that's a long process. It takes two or three years for this to actually assume that kind of shape. But when you do, 
you'll have a more productive limb for fruit and flowers. The other thing about pruning fruit trees is to keep them at a harvestable height. I have a uh, neighbor on either side of me with a cherry tree. Each cherry tree is about 50, 40 or 50 feet tall. And obviously, uh, if you may have had this experience, that's good for the birds, not good for you because you can't get, get you can't harvest your fruit. Uh, so there is a, an attitude about keeping fruit trees short. Um, many of them are, even if they're semi-dwarf trees, will want to grow 12, 15, or 20 feet high. You can go uh, on, in your browser, put in backyard orchard, and there is a website dedicated to backyard orchard growing and the, the argument for keeping a tree short uh, and how you do that is it pretty well, is well covered there. Uh, our trees, we have about 20 fruit trees in the backyard, and this is a small property. Uh, and we're trying to keep them around eight or 10 feet tall at most so that we can enjoy the fruit more than the birds do. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. All right. So I think uh, we have Sheila, and we're going to do a little tag team piece here. So uh, Sheila, can you, you want to start speaking and then I will uh, sure. do the um, share screen. Okay, great. I hope. <laughs> Otherwise I can try to pull it up. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to work. Okay. And let me just go to play, hang on. All right, and then okay. tell me when to advance. All right, great. So you can advance. I'm Sheila. I'm a Solano County Master Gardener, and I'm talking about bee gardening, um, which is um, something that Mo kind of briefly touched on this morning, all of our favorite plants. Um, and the reason I have this photo up is, is because um, I love bees as much as I love um, persimmons. And I love persimmons a lot. And obviously this proves my point. And um, the thing with persimmons is that they're dependent on bees because they're pollinators, just like a third or two thirds of our food is either directly or indirectly. And pollination is super simple. It's just when um, a, a, an animal, a bee, um, a hummingbird, a butterfly, a bat, wind, uh, all those different things, um, transfer the pollen from the male to the female part of the flower so that it can do seeds and fruit. Um, and bees happen to be the superheroes um, of the pollination group. They're, they, they personally benefit from um, the sugary nectar, gives them energy, and um, the pollen is a source of protein for them. They use it in their nesting and to survive. So I just wanted to show you a, um, a pollinator transfer station here and I'll do the thumbs up for the next slide. This is a native bee, it's a mining bee, and you can see the bee is just covered in pollen and this bee just is doing its little, you know, eating, it's, it's going through your garden and it's picking up this pollen everywhere and transporting it intentionally and unintentionally so that we have all of this abundance of food. And I'll do a thumbs up for the next slide. So I'm not gonna talk about my favorite fruit and now I'm gonna talk about my favorite honey, my favorite bees. And this is um, the first one that everybody's familiar with. It's the honey bee. And um, this is a bee imported from Europe. It's not a native bee. And what's, there's super cool things about the honey bee, right? Everybody knows that, like people love honey bees. They lay uh, the queen, is a colony and the queen lays uh, 2,500 eggs a day. All of the males are drones and the queen is um, fertilized by those drones as we say in a, in a um, nice clean PG way. And um, the females are all of the worker bees. So they are out scavenging, they're cleaning the nest, they're baby, taking care of the babies. They're like the, the hard workers of the troop. 
Honeybees can fly up for six miles and as fast as 15 miles per hour and 100 flowers a day. So again, they're the superheroes of the pollinators. They maintain a body temperature of 92 degrees. And what's super cool is you can hear that buzzing noise in the hives sometimes. And that's actually all in unison. The bees will just start moving their wings to cool down the nest. So they're like, they have this col a collaboration that is just incredibly amazing. Um, they have this other thing they do that's awesome called the wiggle dance where the female will go out, the females will go out, the worker bees, they go, will work their way up through the ranks, first taking care of the nests and then cleaning the nests and then on to becoming um, the, the bees that get to go out into the world and find the pollen. And they do, they go out and they find the pollen, they come back to the, to the nest, to the colony, and they have all the other female bees come out and smell them and, the, and taste them. And they'll say, oh yeah, this is great stuff, right? And they'll, they'll decide as a group collectively, oh, this is awesome. And the honeybee will, that particular honeybee will do a, what's called a wiggle dance. And she'll go in a, a, a little eight and the whole time she's um, facing a direction of the sun to show them which direction and she's doing this wiggle dance and she's uh, transferring the information to them. Where is this awesome food that I found? And so then they can go out and take advantage of that same food, which hopefully will be in your garden after this talk, at least some of it. Okay, next slide. So the other bee that I really like that also is a colonizer is the bumblebee. Um, there's over 25 species of bumblebees within California and over 1,600 native bees within the, um, the U.S., um, within California and the U.S. And native bees are the predominant bees that we see. I mean, you everybody knows about honey bees, but the native bees were from here and they got used to the native plants that we have and they they become very specific to those plants. They're excellent pollinators. Their wings beat up to 130 times per second and they vibrate in the flower until the pollen is released. Uh, they build their nests close to the ground. In fact, it's about 70% uh, of all bees are ground nesters. And um, it's really good for you to have some unprocessed ground and debris in your garden. And Again, they are one of the few native bees that is a, a social bee. I mean, a um, yeah, a social bee living in a colony. Most native bees are uh, solitary. The female goes to the nest and the male just finds his way in the world and, and she takes care of her eggs. Okay, next. So um, this is a, a fun story. I was um, out cleaning my bird boxes, my nests, my nests in my um, house, and I knock on the little um, bird nest to find out if there's any babies there before I clean. And I knocked on this little bird um, nest, noticing the, the pollen and the debris outside, and look who came out to say hi to me. And you know, this is a bumblebee. Don't worry about him. He's, they're not going to sting you, most likely. They're just an incredibly wonderful, darling, beautiful pollinator plant that's, that's helping us get our food. Um, typically, they, they do nest underground, um, tufts of grass under the ground in burrows, but this one is in my bird nest and that's not that infrequent. If they, if the birds have built up over years, all that debris, they figure why not, we'll just take advantage of it. So I'm letting them have that birdhouse for this year. And I'm actually, um, will hope they will come back because I, I love bees. So it's really fun to, to go out and um, see them doing their, their, their business. Next. Um, so this is another one of my favorite bees. This is also a native bee. Uh, it's called the teddy bear bee. And this is a male teddy bear and they actually look way prettier than that picture. And I'm sorry, that's not as handsome as they really are. They're just 
gorgeous, fluffy, attractive little bees. And this male doesn't sting. He's like a giant fur ball. I saw him at the Har uh, Hagen Doss house up at UC Davis. It's an outdoor museum and you can go walk around it. It's open every day. It doesn't have the, the docents like they used to because of the, the COVID, but you can walk around, you can see all of the Ceanothus and other beautiful plants there and you can see bees. And then Susan, if you will put the next slide on, you can also maybe be lucky like I was and hold the teddy bear bee. They don't sting, they're super docile and gentle, one of my favorite bees. And um, they literally will let you just hold them and they're adorable. So I hope you get a chance to go visit. Okay, Susan. Um, this is the female to that teddy bear bee. This is the same bee, it's a carpenter bee. And you can see by the chart, I wanted to show you the chart because I wanted you to see how big this is. It's a huge black bee, totally in my garden right now, all over the place. Really likes my poly, polygala plants. And um, what's super cool about her is the fact that she can carry so much pollen on her. And I mean, millions of grains of pollen at a time. It's just huge. And she likes uh, soft decaying wood. So again, it's really great to have your garden being a little bit messy so that she can have some place to nest. And um, she's also one of my favorites because I like to brag sometimes. I mean, that's, I should be humble, but you know, when she comes storming into my yard, everybody knows it, like she's a big girl. So you can say, hey, that's a female carpenter bee. And all your friends will be like super impressed. They'll be like, oh gosh, I didn't know you were such a naturalist. Like you're really smart. And so um, she gives you a lot of bragging rights. All right, Susan. Um, again, a, a sweat bee. Uh, I like this one because of its color. It's like this fluorescent, bright, green, a native bee again, super easy to identify. So I, I look really brilliant. I'm like, oh, there's a sweat bee. Um, the females nest in the flat bare ground. Again, 70% of our native bees do that. So you wanna leave some bare ground. Looks like a small ant bound. So don't go out and put chemicals and you know, if you see an ant, make sure you look for the ants before you do that um, because it could be this native bee. Um, they transfer pollen on their long, long, long hairs on their legs. And um, it says ong, but it means long hairs on their legs. And again, I like this because it, it's beautiful fluorescent color. Okay, Susan. Uh, this is my uh, leaf cutter bee. Looks crazy, right? Um, not somebody you would go, oh yeah, that's my favorite but I have a selfish reason for liking this bee. And Susan, you could do the next picture. I like this bee because it nests in my yard and it's super easy to build nests for. So I get to kind of be in the whole process of this bee's life. Um, the one on the left is one I bought and it was supposed to be a mason bee on the sides and a leaf cutter in the middle and a bumblebee up top, but it never ever never got anybody in it except for spiders. And um, so I wouldn't recommend that one. And the one I use is just um, the one on the top. It's a simple two by four, no chemicals on it. And I just drilled the holes into it. And what is awesome about this bee is that, she, so down below the bottom picture on the right is a picture. What she does is she goes into the back of those, uh, that's actually a bee apartment that I made on that two by four on the upper right. And she'll go into each one of those holes, a different female bee, and they will lay, um, they will spit and put pollen, a spittle and pollen, and then they'll lay their egg and then they'll build a wall of leaf. Again, she's a leaf cutter bee. And then she'll do it again and again and again and again and again. So you have all of these baby bees in a row. And she'll put the females in the back and the males in the front, and then she'll be the guard until um, they're hatched. And um, I just think that's phenomenal that I can help sustain this, this bee that's helping sustain me. It's a really cooperative relationship. So I, I just love that about, about the sweat bee. I mean, about the um, leaf cutter bee. Again, also a native. 
And this is maybe something that if you're, if you got at all excited about bees like I am, this is something that you might want to think about is when you go out and you're treating your, um, your roses or your other plants, um, just remember that the one on the left, how it says two and one systemic. Um, systemic means that it comes, the, the pesticide comes up from the base of the plant. So it will come up through the roots, up through the tree, I mean, up through the plant and into the leaves and into the flowers. So it says this product you can be used for six weeks. Well, that's what it's telling you is that this um, product, which is a uh, part of the reason that there's a decline in the native bees and all bees actually, is um, because of certain uh, pesticides, neotinicanoids, they have associated that with uh, the bee decline. As you all know, there's a huge decline in, in bees right now. And systemic is a word you wanna avoid because it's systemic just means that the poison is gonna be continuously in the plant and that um, what happens with the bees is they, they eat this, uh, this, this poison and they end up losing direction. They can't make it back to the hive and um, they die and the colony declines. Um, it's a combination with the native bees that you have this uh, systemic poisoning um, everywhere you have a decline in, in habitat and you have some viruses and other things that are going on. So if you, um, if you want to try using something like the lower uh, right hand um, product, which says organic. And what that does is maybe it doesn't wash away your, all, your, um, all your issues, but you can use water. You know, the old, the old um, wise tale is you use soap and water for washing off things like the um, aphids and things off of your, you know, which this Rose Advanced BioCare wouldn't even, um, wouldn't even treat anyway. Just take a hose and don't even put the soap in. Just use the water and, and, and wash those roses. And um, if you feed your plants, you know, with like specifically um, the roses really like alfalfa and Epsom salts. You know, if you feed your roses and you make them strong and you add compost, um, then, you know, if you have a little bit of blight, you know, would you rather have persimmons or would you rather have a perfect rose? I'd rather have the persimmons. So I would, I'm going to try to make this plant a really strong plant by feeding it organic materials um, like this, this product on the lower. And, um, and, and try to take a little bit of loss, you know? It, I'd rather have the, the healthy bees. So that's my talk on that. And then I'm gonna talk about some plants that um, are specific to Venetia that are in my garden or a block away. I just took these pictures one day, just walked outside and took pictures. This is a female carpenter on my polygala and I, and I had, um, Susan sent you that list of plants, so you should have them right in front of you. Um, that's the, the polygala petite butterfly bush and the carpenter bee. It, like I said, they're all over my front yard. Beautiful thing. These are all a uh, drought tolerant that I'm talking about now. Drought tolerant, easy to grow, plant, water that first year, all drought tolerant plants you have to water um, because uh, that first year they're not drought tolerant, but then and afterwards they become more and more drought tolerant. So make sure to water it. Don't plant it in July and walk away from it. And so the next one is my lavender. This is the Spanish lavender, beautiful plant, not my favorite of the lavenders. Um, I like the next one, which is called the um, God Godwin Creek. And um, you can get this everywhere. It's a, it's a sturdier plant, lasts longer, does better. Um, you can cut it back, not all the way to the ground, but cut it back in the winter. And it'll, and I cut like a, a third or two thirds off each year of my lavender. And then I leave the rest up for, so it continues to grow. And then the, that new growth. And once the new growth is up, if I'm feeling like it, I'll cut, cut off the third I left otherwise. I'll just leave that third because it's usually flowering sooner. So this is just a stronger plant. This is a poppy that's just out in front and the little guy's visiting it. 
and we see those everywhere right now. The next one is the Pride of Madeira. This is um, all over town right now, now as well. And it's really important for bees if you can try to get these early bloomers like, we're, like I'm showing you right now. I mean, it's really important to have plants that are successional so you have bee, bee food in your garden all the time. But the beginning of the season is of all of the seasons kind of the most important one. Um, this is just a rock rose from my garden where a little guy was visiting. The next one's a uh, Gallardia. And again, all of these are drought tolerant, easy keepers, easy to grow. This one is particularly one of my favorite because it's so brilliantly beautiful. The bees like it, I like it, it's easy to grow. It just is a workhorse. So those are easy to find uh, all over at nurseries. Uh, rosemary, of course is all over. Now with rosemary, it's really important at the um, UC Arboretum, they taught us it's really, really important to um, trim these plants back. You have to be good about trimming your plants back so that they flower again for your pollinators. So don't just plant them and walk away, you know, get in there and at the end of the season, um, cut some off so it'll have some new growth and some new flowers. The next one is just a golden um, bush daisy. Very simple, easy to grow. The next one, um, Mo, I know mentioned one of my favorites as well is hot lips. Love this plant. Again, this is a salvia. Salvias are fabulous for native, all pollinators, for the hummingbirds, bees, you name it, you got it with salvias. Um, the salvias are really cool. You can tell them when you go into the the, the store, you can put your hands on the stem and they got a little squareness to them and it'll say, of course, salvia on the label, but salvias are brilliant. Again, native drought tolerant, easy to grow. Um, the next one is a California lilac, the Ceanothus. There's all kinds right now blooming um, all over, totally drought tolerant ones established. In fact, the reason some people don't like natives is because they usually only live up to 10 years, but that's because they water too much. The less water you put on a native after it's established, once again, after it's established, then the longer it will live. And um, so this is a uh, Ceanothus that you see all over town. Um, they come in all different sizes, all different um, heights, and they uh, look a little bit different. Most of them are purple, some of them are pink. And you can go on the UC Arborate Arboretum website and see pictures of them if you're interested. Um, they have an all-star category with their favorite plants and that's one of them. This is related to the salvias, this is a sage. This is called the Mexican sage. Again, blooms all year, I mean, just, just all summer, you know, long, no work, no fuss. I don't even water mine. And uh, the only time I got stung was one year I went out there to clean up and one of the bees was like, you know, this is our main food source, Sheila. And then one of my neighbors came over and said, oh, you know, it's time for you to trim that back. And right then there was a hummingbird eating out of one of these. And I'm like, you want me to take the hummingbird food away? And so, you know, I love this plant again, because it's just bright and beautiful and fun and the bees love it, all the pollinators love it. Um, great plant to have. Uh, again, you should in the winter cut this one back so that it, it comes up fresh and green and lots of flowers uh, for the pollinators. Got to do your job too. This is um, lion's tail, which I'm sorry about this picture. I was a good gardener and trimmed back my lion's tail so it, the bees would have plenty of of um, flowers this summer, but mine wasn't uh, up for a picture. So I had to incorporate this from, from the um, web, but it is a great plant, absolutely beautiful, stunning plant, easy grower, drought tolerant, pollinators love it, fun to have, just charming. Another one is the aster, which a lot of people have, uh, any variety is good for the pollinators. And then the next one is, um, the borage, which I actually plant in my vegetable garden. Um, Susan said that too. Uh, it seems to do well. It's it's a native plant. It just comes up on its own, but I, I have had it in my garden and it seems to do best there. I love the flowers because you can eat them and it makes you calm. 
um, it's uh, kind of a, a, a remedy and you can put them in salads and the bees love it and everybody loves it. And then um, let's see what else we got. Oh, there's my puppy. <laughs> so um, that's the end of this talk. And um, I don't know, I, I just happened to be at the church working at the CSA this morning, and I saw there was a California native sale going on. Um, it's going to be April 24th through the 29th, and it's our local group. And I'm sure they're going to have a lot of the, these plants available. So if, um, Susan, I, I mailed you the website, if you can shoot that out to people, I don't know if you can do that. That would be great. Uh, that way you, it's online. So you just order and pay online and then you just go pick up. But they should have a lot of the salvias and the sages. They're really good to us at the schools. They donate tons of plants to us. So I had to give them a plug because they're just, they're wonderful. And um, yeah, thank you. So we're open for questions. And even if it's not on um, bees or, or some other questions, we'd be happy to help with that too. So you could just uh, raise your hand if you have a question and then unmute yourself. So no question, oh, Barbara. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Uh, where did you say the um, native garden plant sale was? You said at a church but I yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's the church heritage church is where I saw the sign today. It's second and military. Okay, and in the past, that's always where the church, where the sale has been. Um, I I just saw this this morning and I pulled it up, so I haven't figured out if they're just gonna have people drive up and then they put them in the back of your car. Um, but it'd be worth checking out because I've bought a lot of my um, native plants from them. And the really great <clears throat> thing about supporting them is that um, they just use organic soil. So there's nothing systemic in the plant itself to hurt the pollinators. It's just native soil. Whereas a lot of the big box stores put neonicotinoids in the soil um, when they grow these plants because they, they don't want to lose the plant to a disease or a pest. So you get you bring the plant home and it's got neotinicnoids already in it. And I always just cut off all the flowers at that point before I plant it so that no um, native bees or bees will be um, affected by that because uh, that's not what my intention is at all, you know. So great question. Any, any other? Oh, it's Mo. <laughs> um, mute yourself, Mo. <laughs> I have, uh, it's for <clears throat> Sheila, <laughs> and uh, I love the teddy bear bee, right? Mm -hmm. And I love the carpenter bee, but I never see them together. Are they t a together thing or are they? Oh yeah, they're, they're together for the dirty duty. And then yeah. <laughs> they, they, um, they go their separate ways. That's a really common with um, native bees. They're very solitary <laughs> male is into the nest with the female. Oh. Um, so, it's so just, if, I, if I found the nest, I might find the teddy bear. No, around. you only find the big black uh, female carpenter bee. The teddy bear is the male carpenter bee. So yeah. the only where you're going to see him is he's going to be around your yard or, and he's so cute. Um, or uh, like I said, I saw lots and lots of them at the um, Hagen Doss mm -hmm. bee garden. But yeah, sweetheart. Yeah. Right. So uh, Gail has a question. You have to unmute yourself. You have to, yeah. There you go. Okay, I have two questions. Um, one, if we were, I'm interested in making that B board uh -huh. that, that you showed. Uh, yeah. Where would you mount that? Would you mount it up high, oh, like under an E? Super or? Great question. Awesome question. Yeah. So that should not be in. That should only be in um, morning sun. You don't want it to have it full afternoon sun or you'll heat up all the babies and they'll die. So um, put it somewhere where it gets the morning sun and um, yeah, you could hang it up high because those bees aren't ground dwelling. In fact, if you have any old logs in your yard or any old wood or any old, you know, things like that, they'll take advantage of all that stuff. <clears throat> but if your yard is super 
neat and clean, then yeah, you could go ahead and um, look it up online or um, I might be able, if you give me your email, I might be able to get you the specific hole size that you need to drill. And okay. um, you have to drill it really deep. You, ha you have to use a four by four because it, the hole has to go all the way through to okay. the back um, so that because the females are put in first, right? And then the males. And if you don't get enough of the males, then you don't really have a lot of success. So you <laughs> want to make them deep enough where you go all the way through the four by four, and then um, and then you can mount it up high with that piece of back. And then every two years, you should replace it because um, bacteria happens. And I used to just redo all the holes until I went to a talk at the UCR, UC Davis and the B um, specialist, PhD specialist said, oh, you're just, you're just pushing all the bacteria to the back of the nest. How could you do that? And I went home and I tore down all my bee nests and rebuilt them. <laughs> so yeah, so you can use the little tiny throw away um, cones that they have, but mm -hmm. I have those to be successful I think the bees just really like the natural wood they're just so if you have any logs and stuff like that that you don't mind having in your garden I've even seen people take logs and wrap little twine around them to make prettier or whatever so just you know the point is kind of leave your debris where you can don't feel guilty about it that makes you a good gardener a good a na good naturalist leave your debris and um, have fun with those <clears throat> I mean it's thrilling to go out there and you're like oh can you imagine how many babies I have out in my in my yard? <laughs> I love I love it. So if you want more information on that, um, tell like me yeah. specific. Thank you. My other question is probably for Mo or Jean. Um, it's a it's about a, it's about plants. I have this bougainvillea that I pruned because it got frosted, and now my leaves look like this. And I don't know why they look like that. Instead of being a dark, healthy green, they've got orange and yellow around the edges. And any ideas? You see? I, I see Is it, it all of them or just a few of them? All of them. Mm. Mo, it looks like sunburn. Yeah, it looks like okay. sunburn. Because I was, I did move it over a little bit and we, and we extended the fence so it's a warmer spot. So bougainvillea need a cooler spot? I thought they liked full sun. They do. They love full sun, but they also don't like wind. So I don't know if you moved it to a windier spot. No, it's, no, it's less windy where it okay, is. Okay, well, that's perfect. So give it a chance. Don't don't give up okay. on it because- Well, I, re I repotted it. And so I'm thinking maybe the soil is different or the water is different or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I moved mine actually to underneath. I have it in a pot and I moved it to underneath my lemon tree uh, to because when we had that little hot spell. So I did that and now we're having this little wind spell. So I'm just going to kind of leave it there for a little bit and it's then scooch yeah. it out as as the environment. OK, goes. so I need to maybe we'll put the umbrella. Up. <clears throat> yeah. There's an umbrella right there. You put that up. All right. I think Bobby had a question. Uh, yes, um, Jean, when you were talking about pruning, you said uh, the three Ds, or you had like three Ds, three Cs, and three yeah. Ss, and I missed most of that. Can you repeat okay. that, please? I'll go through it slowly. Okay. <laughs> the three Ds are dead, diseased, and damaged. Right. The three Cs are crossing, crowded, or competing. Okay. And three S's are safety, sight lines, and shape. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Other questions? I always have questions, so I'll ask one. <laughs> so Jean, um, yes. last year uh, when you gave the talk, I did the square foot garden, right? Yeah. And so now I'm getting ready to plant again. And I had cover crops in there. And I, you told us last time not to dig them up, right? Just to cut them off, leave the roots in. But my roots haven't decayed enough for me to plant in them. What do hmm. I do? Well, then 
uh, you, you, in order to get your plants in, you're going to have to take the roots up, I guess. Okay. You know, the, I don't know why they wouldn't have de decomposed by now. Yeah. But you don't want a second crop when you're really trying to grow lettuce or right. whatever. Yeah. So go so ahead and take try to just roots. chop them up a little bit and leave them in. Yeah. Or yeah. you can do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they, but because they they will if if they're a nitrogen uh, producing plant, you know that will still be present in those little bits of root that you have left behind. Yeah, sure. So maybe I needed to cut them back earlier. Yeah. So 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 how many months before does it usually take for them to decay? Two months or? I would say a couple months. Yeah. A couple months at least. Okay. All right. Next year. <laughs> What are you planting? Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I actually, to put a little plug in for a local uh, nursery, Grow a Pear Nursery, did this great thing this year where they're small, they're, they're in Vallejo. And uh, they did a great thing where they uh, said you could pre-order whatever you wanted them to grow for you. So they did all the starts. So now everything's ready. I've got peppers and tomatoes and uh, eggplant and squash and beans and everything, herbs. Yeah, and... Great. So I just need to get the soil moved around enough so there's some room <laughs> among those, those roots. Well, Susan, what was your green crop that you grew? Um, I did a couple of different ones. In that bed, uh, I put in red clover, which oh, I loved. Great. Awesome. And then I also put in... Um, uh, peas and uh, uh, wheat, wheat, uh, wheat, and another, and another uh, one to see to kind of compare. Mm -hmm. And it's it's actually the wheat that's got the really huge roots. Yeah. So what uh, Susan's talking about is that um, it's really important not to leave your sp your spot empty over the winter, even if you are not interested in growing. Um, anything particular, because you just don't want to deal with it in the winter, just throw a, a, a ground cover or cover crop in there, um, like fava beans or something, uh, so that you can keep the microorganisms in the soil going, keep everything dynamic. Um, it's, it's important not to leave it empty. All right, any other questions? Oh, uh, Barbara has another question. Yeah, uh, since um, Gail brought up her, um, I'm sorry, what, what plant was that that you were talking about? Gail, your leaf? Um, bougainvillea. Bougainvillea, that's right, the bougainvillea. So my, I'll, I'll bring up a question on mine. My bougainvillea has gotten worse and worse and worse and longer and nastier thorns over the years. Is that just something it does with age or am I getting an old root stock coming out or what? Because what started out as little thorns when it was young is now probably some two inch thorns on it. My, my guess is that it would, it would be age that's doing it. You may need to really cut it back, prune it severely and you know, stimulate new growth and then you'll get back to your smaller thorns. Well, actually, it was almost when I was cutting it way, way back because it got out of control. I cut it way back, and it's almost like the new stocks have oh. the heavier, bigger thorns. Yeah. So I thought, well, maybe I cut it back so far it sent out root stock from an old. <laughs> well, could be, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I have one more question. <laughs> so I use soaker hoses in my vegetable garden, but then I was like thinking about how most of them are made out of like recycled rubber. Is that, is that, is that okay? I mean, should I be looking for safer transport material for my water? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Go ahead, Jean. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I don't think there's any any problem with the, with the recycled rubber. Uh, that's just my opinion. But there's another uh, problem you may have experienced, and that is 
uh, one of the problems with, with a soaker hose, depending on how long your run is, how long a hose it is, um, it doesn't have a way of compensating so that you may be getting more water in the, in the early part of the hose and not enough water in the back, in the final part of the hose. Uh, that's that's one disadvantage, or it's just something to be watched for so that you can compensate otherwise. But I don't think there's anything uh, damaging health-wise to having having it come through recycled rubber. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I do try to think about the placement of the plants, and because because you're right, um, you it does kind of peter out. Mm -hmm. I do like the um, I do like. I mean, soaker hoses for me have always just disintegrated so quickly that it makes me a little bit concerned. But I do really like the seven or six inch emitter hoses um, that you can get uh, at local hardware stores uh, that lets out water every six inch and it and it really it manages the water so it comes out at equal pressure and allows the water to come out at, at an equal pressure and you could run those through your bed so that you put a emitter here and a emitter here and an emitter here and an emitter here. And um, it's pretty simple to do, but it, uh, it, you know, you do deal with a lot of plastic with that kind of irrigation. It's just kind of inevitable unless you do an overhead um, sprinkler, which again has its issues because then you burn your leaves and you have all kinds of problems that way. So, um, yeah, it's kind of what we have to do. Any other questions? So I'm gonna turn it back to Diane to close us up here. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mo and <clears throat> Jean and Sheila. Um, it was a very interesting uh, discussion and very interesting presentation. I especially enjoyed the stuff about the bees. And um, I only have a, I live in a townhouse development, so I have a very tiny little space to do some gardening in, but I love my salvias and other, some of my bee loving plants. And so um, we're very grateful to you and to the audience that attended. Our next, um, public speaker series is on May 20th. And Susan, do you know who the speaker is? It's not on our calendar yet, but I thought we had, I thought we might have lined somebody up, but I. Uh, we're going to be having a speaker from an organization called Covia, C-O-V-I-A. And it's like a, so you know how we all went on to Zoom uh, during the pandemic? Well, they have been doing programs free for um, people online forever. And that's what they're gonna come talk about. So someone's gonna come present and they do, they have, they have a program for everything. I mean, you know, matter what you wanna learn how to do or you wanna be talking to other people, whether it's gardening, whether it's, it's um, public speaking or whether it's craft making or whether it's um, political action, they have, they have a group. Anyway, so Covia. Uh, uh, Ann Balter, who actually lives here in Benicia, uh, is going to come speak to us uh, in May. Great. Yeah. So, and please visit our website, carquinasvillage.org frequently. You may find interesting there, inf information there that you can find helpful. And uh, sometimes we have other programs that are for the general public too, not just the monthly speaker series. So it's worth a look at the events calendar now and then, and you can sign up for May 20th, even though the speaker is not currently listed. So with that, we'll end our program today and have a wonderful time in the beautiful sunshine in your gardens. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you guys.